welcome to LLT 180 Hero and Quest. I am your instructor, Dr. Joseph Hughes, and today we're in our discussion of probably the greatest book and most meaningful reading experience I have ever had in my entire darn life, Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut. I'd like to begin today by asking you for your impressions or questions about the book Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut. Yes, Sam. I quite liked it a lot. It's one of my new favorites. Okay, well, obviously I like that. Okay, other comments or questions? Becky. No, you're Elena. You're Becky. And you're Jackson. I am. You just mess, you sat in those places to mess with my head. Okay, it's all your, who, it's all Becky's fault. More, more questions. Yeah, go ahead, Hunter. When he talks about penis size, is he relating that back to like how manly a guy is, or like how, I don't know what really about him, but like, yeah, how manly they are. Well, maybe we'll let one of the ladies answer that question. But <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I, I think that um, Vonnegut is very much a product of his age, and today in a society where you can walk around and just say vagina, 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 all you want. Um, it's no big deal, but back in the 1960s and late early 70s when Kurt Vonnegut was writing this book, the idea of human sexuality studies and feminism, it was all just really wild and crazy and new. And they went from a society in which we don't say penis and vagina in public. We say tweeter and whatever else. I don't know. I just made that last part up. But all of a sudden, it's just all front and center. Magazines talking about you know human sexual response, right and left. I think Vonnegut is satirizing both the, trad the traditional macho, you know, position of more is more. And um, also, I think the quote-unquote scientific study, you know, they, because they also keep statistics of how many orgasms people have in a regular month. So I think it's just Vonnegut just like laughing at the whole darn thing. Although you did read that part where the guy had a penis that was like, what, 398 feet long, but most of it, pardon? Most of it? is in the fourth dimension. <laughs> That's how. Okay, that was, was that a good enough answer? I like my answer. More questions. Give me, yeah, Sammy, go ahead. Okay, where I'm at so far, is was he really trying to be actually a little bit serious and deep in a sense because of some of the way he would phrase things? Uh, and then he would, it, to me it was just like he was being utmost serious and then he would just go off the deep end of something a little bizarre but that's kind of what I was getting at almost like a, a, a going back to maybe a, a, a different time in his head when he thought things were a little bit better yes and that everybody was starting to go a little bit wacko and crazy and this is yes. it just didn't kind of mesh with what he felt was maybe uncomfortable and he liked his work better. Also true. <coughs> okay, hang on a sec there, Sam, because I have to give Sammy's answer the serious and brilliant answer it deserves. This one's for you, kid. Um, it is typical of people, of the, those of us who are members of the over 50 sec, cent, 50 cent, 50 <laughs> section of society. Woo, I feel like I should like flash a sign or something like that, but the only one I know is the shocker. <laughs> the um, the um, tendency is, and you're going to have it too, is as you get older, you're going to look at these kids, these little babies, and you're going to think, what is wrong with these people, you know? I mean, I say this affectionately, but the way you people dress, you know, the stuff you wear, the things you do to your hair, you know, just I just find it beyond offensive, just horrible, you know, just... And I know why you do it, too. You know, the same reason you listen to all that horrible music that you listen to. It offends old guys like me. Oh, big time, big time. It gets even worse. It gets even worse when I realize, and this comforts me, that you're going to have kids. You're going to become parents someday. And they're going to come home, and they're going to, you know, like, well, 
you brought home a girl who has no tattoos, no piercings, and her hair is the same color. She's wearing a dress, for God's sake, and her hair is the same color it was when she was little. Where did I go wrong with you? These little kids that are getting pushed around in strollers and stuff, they're going to come up with new ways to make you two think as pitiful as the 2010s were. It's far preferable to the world that these little boogers are going to bring in, and it's going to work like clockwork. All right. See? She just suspended the six-year-old kid for saying he's sexy and he's ugly. Yeah. Yes. What? Well, what did yeah, they bring me again? Boy, he was he's six years old, and he was in the lunch line sick to another six-year-old girl, and he was saying, I'm sexy, and I know it, and he got suspended for two days. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they call it sexual harassment. For sexual but he is not by himself. Uh, <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a um, long, it's a traditional <laughs> male behavior to sexually harass oneself. Um, <laughs> it's a song. Is it a popular song? Yes, very popular. Do girls sing it too? Okay, I don't know, but you've just proven, you have just proven that the world really is going to hell in a handbasket. I, I really am washing my hands of this whole generation. I've done my best this semester to try to give you a respectful attitude towards society by leading you through contemplation of the masterpieces of Western literature, such as Gilgamesh, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Frogs, um, Dante's Inferno, Google's Nose, but... What else do you got? What other questions that I can answer for you today? Or observations about this wonderful book? Yes, your name is still Sierra, right? Correct. Okay, Sierra. Um, I just, when you said the question last week, like the relationship between it and Gilgamesh, I was trying, you know how in Gilgamesh you know that the Odyssey is about Odysseus, and then when you read the book, you realize that Odysseus is actually the Odysseus, and it's actually Odysseus, and it's actually the 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 Odysseus, and it's let me write this on the board. Gilgi, Enki, Dwayne, and Kilgore. And let's just go through them since you asked here. I think it's a good question. Okay, Gilgamesh. Um, what's his life like? Is he, would people, most guys want to be Gilgamesh? Yes. Why? Okay. Is Gilgamesh pretty happy with his life at the beginning? Yes. Yeah, everything's okay. Enkidu, as you point out, is created to specifically give Gilgamesh a run for his money, etc. Um, what else do we know about Enkidu? Come on in, Camille. He what? He's wild. He you said he's wild. Okay. Oh. Said that. Okay. Wild as what? Somebody over here tell me what does he do? How does he live? I love all you girls, but I mean you're doing, you know, I need to see who else is reading this crap. Yeah, go ahead. Chris, Taylor, Trent, Travis, <laughs> Terence, <Travis>. Tremaine. <laughs> Tito! Okay, go ahead. I like that. He doesn't even realize he's a human. Me hungry. Me eat. Me bored. Me run around. Me horny. Me so horny. <laughs> it, well put. He doesn't even know he's a human. Doesn't even know he's alive. He doesn't even know whether his life is worth living, I don't think, because... He never asks a question. That's like a typical human question. Nice. What else do you have? Comparing Gilgamesh to Enkidu, and then we line them up and pair them off with Dwayne Hoover and Kilgore Trout. Pardon? Nobody really wants to be Enkidu. I mean, <laughs> he's kind of what? Ooh, 
Nice, nice Sam. Yeah, he's he's kind of like Iron Man. You know, nobody <laughs> wants him. No, no, no. He was turned to steel in a great magnetic field when he traveled time for the future of mankind. And Ozzy's exact words are, "Nobody wants him." Enki, dude, nobody wants to be him. Everybody wants to be him. How about Dwayne Hoover and Kilgore Trout? Tell me one thing about Dwayne Hoover, Sam. Everybody wants to be him because he's that nice, charming car salesman that has a great life, or so it seems. Okay, excellent. What else? Kayla, what do you got? Do people want to be him? Why? You owe Becky one. Go ahead. What do people whisper when he walks by? <laughs> Fabulously well to do. And then they whisper, his wife drank Drino. And then he writes. And I think he draws Drano and also puts down the molecular um, structure of Drano. Again, it's parody. Okay. Um, according to um, Vonnegut, why do people act so damn crazy sometimes? And we're what? We're test tubes filled with bad chemicals. Or other, no, that's pretty good actually. Or we're machines that are badly built. There aren't any good reasons. Google doesn't even know. He just gives up. You know, he just, one day he's talking about this nose walking around through the city of St. Petersburg. And he just says, well, really weird things happen. I don't know why, but Vonnegut knows why. We're all full of bad chemicals and stuff like that. And I don't know if the nose has eyes. Okay, what else do we know about Dwayne Hoover that's worth knowing? Yes, no? Sam? His son is gay. His son is gay, yes. Is he crazy? Yes, he is crazy. How do you know he's crazy? Yeah, he's trying to kill himself at the beginning of the book and all of that. That's always a sign that something's wrong. That's a good answer. Okay, what else? Yeah, go ahead. Didn't you say he like talks to his dog like it's a person or something? Wait, now let me ask you. Um, I, know, I mean, I know a lot of people do that, but I feel like you're, you're looking at one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, especially my middle dog, the Yongi Bongi Bo dog, I have long conversations with him. They're mostly about how ferocious he is. But I also talk to other people during the course of an average day. Okay, but so Travis, you've got a good point. Tony? Uh, he's a widower. He's a widower. Okay, so and yeah, that's going to do it for you. Um, what else? What else? What else do we know about? What does Dwayne Hoover want? There is one thing he wants. Bethany? Right. Yeah, he wants to not be crazy. I don't know why anybody would want to not be crazy. Have any of you ever known somebody who was literally not crazy, just completely rational and sane? Can you figure, imagine just how sad of a life that would be if all of your decisions were wise and rational? Well, most of us guys really do operate on wisdom and ra <laughs> Just back up to the door here. Okay, so Dwayne wants an answer. He wants to know the meaning of life. He wants the answer. He wants the answer, damn it. Kilgore Trout, yeah. Undesirable by society, kind of smelly. Nobody wants him. Nobody wants him? Go ahead. He's not like an Iron Man, he's an aluminum man. Go ahead. Only like three fourths of the way through the book, but really he just wants to go and like show the, I guess the side set or the sad side of art. Like he wants to show the people that didn't find the meaning in their art and stuff, and that's what came out of him. Failure. Yes! What is the um, proper term for such attitudes and such behavior? Anybody? I'm going to put this on the test. So zo zoom in on this.
Look at how I'm writing, how beautifully I'm writing this. Okay, the correct word is cynicism. It is taken from the Greek word kuon, which means dog. Has anybody here studied philosophy? Okay, hey, Chris, right? Okay, whew. Um, what do you know about the cynic philosophers? Uh, they did think everything was crap. This is what my ancient history professor, Dr. Stagakis, said, the one who told me that all the Greeks were gay, told me about the cynical philosophers. They thought everything was crap. They dressed as cheaply as they could. They satisfied their physical needs as cheaply and as trouble freely as they could so that, and this stuck with me over the ages. I was told this, I'm sure, in the fall of 1978. If a cynic philosopher was walking down to the street and decided that he had to defecate, he would defecate right there in the street because it was the philosophical thing to do. Now, if I were like Vonnegut, I could grow, you know, stand up and draw a picture of a Greek in a tunic taking a crap out in the middle of the road, but I think most of you can work up a pretty good visual of that anyway. The cynics took a jaundiced, wrong view of everything. Everything sucked. And I have to tell you that when I was a young pup, honest to God, when I read this for the first time, I was a very, very cynical human being, too. I was 15 years old, and I almost prided myself on my cynicism. And then as I got older and became an alcoholic, um, I prided myself even more deeply on my cynicism because, you know, it's fun to be cynic, cynical. The sad news is, and this is something, there's a good example. Somebody asked me a brilliant question on Thursday. Um, what's it like to read the same book after, you know, 20 years? I saw this book as an enabling force in my cynicism. You know, all the cynical things Vonnegut says about, you know, Oh, let's see, 1492 was a really stupid year. That's when the White Sea Pirates came in and, um, you know, started massacring the people who already lived there were leading meaningful and productive lives and about how the Star Spangled Banner is really a stupid song. Not to sound unpatriotic, it is kind of a dumb song. It's hard to sing well. But with time... I kind of shed my cynicism. I'm not telling you you need to do this yet, shed your cynicism, whatever cynicism you have, because you need to be youthful and irreverent and iconoclastic and obsequious. God knows I was. Obse don't be obsequious. Um, but it's very easy to sit in the weeds and criticize. You know, it's much harder to try to accomplish something a little bit positive, as I know you all do, in your own corner of the world. As um, Stephen Patrick Morrissey once observed, it's so easy to laugh, it's so easy to hate. It takes guts to be gentle and kind. And then he starts singing about how he can feel the soil falling over his head because he's Morrissey and that's what he does. So in answer to your inquiries or whatever the hell I was talking about, um, the development of Trout as a character is particularly important to me as an old American, as a recovering cynic, recovering alcoholic, recovering Catholic, um, because he's cured of his cynicism. Um, he, fig he gets it into his head that these people, why is it that Kilgore Trout has been invited to talk at this Festival of the Arts? Mm, Camille. Yes, somebody named Elliot Rosewater thinks he is the greatest writer who ever lived and he's not gonna donate any money unless Kilgore Trout comes to speak. What's Kilgore Trout's reaction when he's invited to come and speak at this festival? 
Go ahead. Huh? Kind of first, and yeah, and then he asks his parakeet. <laughs> talking to your animals. Who is the one who thinks that talking to your animals is weird? I, I do too. What do you say to your dog or cat? Well, no, I, he asks Bill and all that. Um, he thinks it's all a bunch of crap. And then he decides, yeah, he's going to go there and just completely expose the semi dark underside of art, people who worked and suffered, and what did they get for it? Say the magic word. It's not doodly squat. Doodly squat. <coughs> Dwayne is fabulously well to do. Kilgore Trout basically has. Doodly squat. What are the nature of Kilgore Trout's publications? What does he publish? No, Hunter, you're good. You've been reading this. No, Sam, this is good. You've been reading this. And you're both putting your heads down and pouting. Devon. When he does articles. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Don't they usually start, like, I guess, publishing adult magazines? Yeah, yeah, in like Swank or Buttock Review or something like that. Yeah, do they pay him? No. Do they need to No, they, <laughs> so he has to spend all this time wandering around pornographic bookstores looking for articles. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, um, what was it? Pan Galactic Straw Boss became mouth crazy. And in, the article was like two college co-eds with some guy in a sombrero mm -hmm. or stuff like that. And to me the hilarious thing is that even when Vonnegut writes this, he's not only sending up Kilgore Trout, he is lampooning and parodying everybody who has ever tried to write anything, including his own bad self. Oh, it's just precious and wonderful. So when Kilgore Trout comes and shows up at these people, you know, when he comes to the festival, how does he get to the festival? No, please, no, Sam. You're good. John, did you read this? Bad. Who else? Dylan, go ahead. Okay, how many of you have ever hitchhiked? None of you have ever hitchhiked? Me either. Pardon? That's funny. No, I, my cousin used to hitchhike, but he also wrestled at 185 pounds when he was in high school. So if you tried anything funny, he could just like squish your head like a zit, and then you would stop doing this to him. <laughs> what kind of places does he go? Who does he meet on his trip? Does he have any <clears throat> liminal experiences? Go ahead, Camille. He sleeps in a pornographic movie theater just oh. to be like a dirty old man. Yes, and how many of us haven't slept in a por... <laughs> no, you all stay awake. You're... Okay, more. Go ahead. He gets kidnapped and wakes up with his pants around his ankles. <laughs> <laughs> And then he, they ask him who kidnapped him, right? Well, no, that's not what he says. That's, you're right, but that's not what he says. What is your name again? Asher. Asher. I've got to remember that. Okay, your name is? I knew that. I think it was James last time. But... Fair enough. <laughs> um, did you say they were nondescript? They could have been like gaseous beings from the planet? Yeah, he said it could have been, for all he knows, an intelligent gas from Pluto. And that comes out as a news report. Somebody named Kilmer Trotter was attacked by the Pluto gang. And these Hispandex kids who live in um, New York City decide one of them is an artist. So he paints on the back of their leather jackets the Pluto gang, which Vonnegut draws. I just thought that was just really awesome. The professor was stripped down to his candy-striped underwear shorts and his socks and his garters and his mortarboard, which was a hat that looked like this. <laughs> there was absolutely nothing about a professor or a sorority or a university anywhere in the body of the book. 
The book was in the form of the letter to the letter to the creator of the universe, to the only creature in the universe who had free will. There's one more I did want to. Harry Lesaber. What's up with Harry Lesaber? No. Dylan. Is he like uh, his coworker? He like came back from the war and then he like was a hidden transvestite. <laughs> yes, exactly. He was the sales manager in in the movie. He's played by the great actor Nick Threeball Nolte. No fooling. And he, when he comes home, he is a rare bird of paradise. And how many orgasms a month does he have? It's just an unreal number of orgasms a week that he has and stuff like that. And he's a, named after a Buick, but he sells Pontiacs, which is also really bizarre. Who else works down at the Pontiac dealer? It's worth noticing. Bethany? I don't know the name of the Pontiac driver. Is it a friend? His lady friend. Her name is? Go ahead, Becky. Francine Pefko, who is now going to be on the test, too. Okay, don't be cynical. Look at this. Can I block print like nobody's business or what? Okay. Pardon? Okay, Lay, tell me who Francine Pefko is. What's her story? Karen? Yeah, go ahead. Travis? Isn't uh, uh, Uber just like convinced that she tries to like, get him to buy a KFC? Shh. Elena? She is the widow of a Viet guy who died in the Vietnam War. She is the um, fanatically, fantastically devoted secretary at the car dealer of Frank, of Dwayne Hoover, and she's also his mistress. There's this touching little scene, you're right, Travis, where they go to the motel that Dwayne Hoover himself owns. They have sexual intercourse with each other, which to me just brings up the whole thing about Enkidu and the Harlot all over again. Because here's um, Dwayne Hoover, his life is an uproar, everything's going nuts, the earth swills, goes down under his feet when he walks around, and um, Francine Pefko puts her arms around him and says, Mommy will make it all feel better. Sometimes I think that's why God put us women here on earth, is to make everything better for you men. You have to work so hard and all of that, blah, 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 blah. And then she suggests, go ahead, Travis. We're going to buy a KFC franchise. And put it across the street. And she only does it because she's looking out for him. It probably would be a good place to um, put in a KFC franchise. But what does he do? He flips out. Why? Because he thinks that she's just using that to get KFC. <laughs> yeah, you're a machine. You're an effing machine. Wind you up and it'll eff your brains out, and then she will ask you for a Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise. <laughs> Dwayne is nuts. Who else works there? Who's probably the sanest person, the most <laughs> well the happiest and sanest person in the whole car. And it's not Vern Gar because his wife thinks that she's trying to turn his, he's trying to turn her brains into plutonium. Harry? I would, you know, you could make a case for Harry. Who else? There's one other character who's practically also a doublet. Go ahead. Is it that guy that, like, got out of prison? Wayne, his name is Wayne Hubler. Yeah. Wayne Hubler. The guy who just got out of prison. And what's he going to do with his life now that he's out of prison? Try to work for Dwayne. Why is that? You're right. It's, a, it's just like, because it's meant to be. Everybody loves Dwayne. He wants to work for Dwayne Hoover. And what happens when he meets Dwayne Hoover? 
Go ahead, Hunter. He has that echo thing, and all he keeps saying is like, this is the last word of what he says, so he thinks he's an ass. <laughs> okay. And well, he doesn't send him away. He sends him to Harry LeSabre. Yeah. And then what happens? Oh, anything. Just anything. This is just so absurd. It's just such a, a series of absurd-ass circumstances. We could beat it into the ground. Everybody's nuts. But we have to bring the characters together because Sierra asked us this question for a purpose. Where do they all come together? Okay. Um, what part of the Holiday Inn? Why is the lounge significant? Bunny Hoover. Yeah, that works. Why else is a lounge? Anybody in this class should be able to answer the question, what is so significant about the hero coming into a tavern. When you're done yawning, Janet, I'm going to pry it out of your head. Be quiet. You're not Janet, damn it. What did she say? Why, Taylor, you're being surprisingly quiet today, Taylor. Have you been, like, studying for classes besides mine? Okay, go ahead, Jack. Bartenders always like the wise advice giver. Exactly. All the way from Siduri on down. Exactly. Just like Siduri tells Gilgamesh, sees the day. Who's all in the bar at meltdown time? Okay, and what is, well, yeah, Bonnie is the waitress who says, Breakfast of Champions. Okay, who else? Uh, the two artists, the one's a writer, one's an artist. Beatrice Kiesler is the writer, and she's really boring. The artist is Rabo Karabekian, who not only has a nice name, he is the next best thing. He could even be a precursor to the Kardashians. He's also a major league. Wait a second. I am now going to reproduce his famous painting, the, what is it called? The Saints. Uh, Anthony. Yeah. That's it. Because everybody is a vertical bond light. So yeah, he's a pile of crap. Who else? And tell me a bit more about Kilgore Trout's arrival. In um, how does he get into um, Midland City? Okay, Sam, you are awesome. But I have to see who else. I have to see who else. Okay, just reading this. What is the deal with sacred miracle? I get. You all heard that too, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's all I care about. If somebody's phone ringing, I don't care. It wasn't like Planet Zontar contacting me. What's the deal with Sacred Miracle Creek? <laughs> Go ahead, Josh. Uh, it's polluted. Really polluted. How polluted is it, Sam? Uh, it counts Kilgore Trout's feet with plastic and he can't get it off. And the <laughs> structure of it is something like this. It's kind of like another pointless show of erudition, like when I write ancient Greek up on the board, knowing that I'm the only one in the class who can read it. Okay. Okay, then he gets into the hotel, right? And this is a nice scene. It's not in the grand scheme of things. Um, that important for the book because it's the um, what's his nuts hang on a second Harold Wilk Bunny's mom Sammy Davis Jr. Shaz Butter Diners Club Ooh, Echolalia there we go there we go there we go <clears throat> This is the molecule that polluted Sacred Miracle Creek. 
I don't know if we can show this on TV or not because it's probably copyrighted or something like that. <clears throat> but I am going to have to read this to you. At the, as it happened, the only other person in the lobby at the time was the beautiful young desk clerk, Milo Maritimo. Milo's clothing and skin and eyes were all the colors that olives can be. He was a graduate of the Cornell Hotel School. He was the homosexual grandson of Guillermo Little Willie Maritimo, a bodyguard of the notorious Chicago gangster Al Capone. Trout presented himself to this harmless man, stood before his desk with his bare feet far apart and his arms outspread. The abominable snowman has arrived he said to Milo. If I'm not as clean as most abominable snowmen are, and it gets better here, that voice hurts me, it is because I was kidnapped as a child from the slopes of Mount Everest, taken as a slave to a bordello in Rio de Janeiro, where I have been clearing the unspeakably filthy toilets for the past 50 years. A visitor to our whipping room there screamed in a transport of agony and ecstasy that there was to be an arts festival in Midland City. I escaped on a rope of sheets taken from a reeking hamper. I have come to Midland City to have myself acknowledged before I die as the great artist I believe myself to be. That's a great way to introduce yourself to somebody. Anybody want to guess what Milo Maritimo's response is? I mean, if you were him, what would you do? No, not you, Sam. I adore you. What would you do? I run. <laughs> Milo Maritimo greeted Trout with luminous adoration. Mr. Trout, he said in rapture, I'd know you anywhere. Welcome to Midland City. We need you so. How do you know who I am? said Kilgore Trout. Nobody had ever known who he was before. You had to be you, said Milo. Trout was deflated, neutralized. He dropped his arms, became childlike now. Nobody ever knew who I was before. I know, said Milo. We have discovered you and we hope you will discover us. No longer will Midland City be known merely as the home of Mary Alice Miller, the women's 200-meter breaststroke champion of the world. It will also be the city which first acknowledged the greatness of Kilgore Trout. Milo not, Trout simply walked away from the desk and sat down on a brocaded Spanish-style settee. The entire lobby, except for the vending machines, was done in Spanish style. Why we need to know that is beyond me. <clears throat> Milo now used a line from a popular television show which had been popular a few years back. Milo now said to the master what the master of ceremonies would have said to Trout if Trout had been on the show and the curtain was going up. Kilgore Trout, this is your life. This guy has read every single novel Kilgore Trout has ever read. On page 239, Nice Milo says, and I quote, Oh, Mr. Trout, Nice Milo went on there in Trout's suite, teach us to sing and dance and laugh and cry. We've tried to survive so long on money and sex and envy and real estate and football and basketball and automobiles and television and alcohol, on sawdust and broken glass. Listening to that for a second, does that sound like a fair indictment of American society? Yes? No? Are you nodding up and down, Becky? Sex and envy. Okay, where's the sex part? Where's the envy part? What place do people's envy here in this fine country? 
How about um, alcohol? How so, Sierra? Well, yeah, and how much money is made selling alcohol? What happened when they tried to make alcohol illegal? They made more alcohol and sold it for lots of money. Okay, does sex sell? Oh, yeah. How about, how about envy? How about basketball? Okay, how about football? Real estate? Money? Automobiles? Yeah. Pardon? Absolutely. How about sawdust and broken glass? No, because that's a stinging value judgment on what all of the other stuff is. Milo wants us to look, be artistic. Here's Trout's, here is Trout's reply. Open your eyes, said Trout bitterly. Do I look like a dancer, a singer? A man of joy? He was wearing his tuxedo now. It was a size too large for him. He had lost much weight since high school. His pockets were crammed with mothballs. They bulged like saddlebags. Open your eyes, said Trout. Would a man nourished by beauty look like this? You have nothing but desolation and desperation here, you say? I bring you more of the same. My eyes are open, said Milo warmly, and I see exactly what I expect to see. I see a man who is terribly wounded because he has dared to pass through the fires of truth to the other side, which we have never seen. And then he has come back again to tell us about the other side. I'm going to read that passage from page 240 of this edition of Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions again. My eyes are open, said Milo warmly, and I see exactly what I expect to see. I see a man who is terribly wounded because he has dared to pass through the fires of truth to the other side, which we have never seen. And then he has come back again to tell us about the other side. People, does this description sound in the least familiar? Edgar, your name is Edgar. What is your name? Frank. Edgar, it's Edgar now. Edgar, what does this sound like to you, Edgar? Oh, thank you. Because otherwise, well, no, obviously. Milo sees in Kilgore Trout the wisdom figure, but what does he look like? Getting back to Sierra's excellent question, if he were to look like one of these two characters, who does he look like? Anyone? I would vote, one vote for Enkidu, because he's raggedy ass and he's really no better than an animal. Did I say... Ass. <laughs> it's such a nice, cute and beautiful world. Asler, Asler, Asler. Um, he also looks kind of like Gilgamesh. Remember that interchange interaction between Gilgamesh and Siduri, where Siduri is originally afraid of Gilgamesh. She says, you have the face of one who has wandered long in the desert and is tired from the journey. And Gilgamesh says, why shouldn't I look like one who has traveled for a long time and my face is weary from the long journey, when in fact I have traveled for, and I am broken up with loss for the loss of my friend Enkidu. Basically, He's looking like Gilgamesh. He's looking like Enkidu. He's looking like crap. He doesn't think he knows anybody. Doesn't think anybody knows him. Here, he's been planning to just ruin everybody's brains. And the little piece of his cynicism is starting to already sift away. So we've got Dwayne Hoover is in the, is in the house. 
Kilgore Trout is in the house, Rabo Karabekian in the house, Bunny Hoover is in the house, the waitress is in the house, there's one other person who is in the room. Becky. Himself. It's really cool. He's wearing sunglasses and smoking a cigarette and watching his characters interact with each other. It takes most of the book to build up to this point. At least the Gilgamesh epic has the decency to have Gilgamesh and Enkidu have their fight right off the bat, and then we can see the consequences afterwards. Vonnegut decides that he has to bring his two protagonists into contact. But just remember, he's the third. He's the third alter ego here. What he does is he makes Dwayne Hoover run up to Kilgore Trout, put his chin on his shoulder. Has anybody ever done that to you? That is just one of the most sublimely annoying things that can ever happen. If somebody comes up and puts their chin on your shoulder and digs it in there and says, I want the answer. Kilgore Trout does what any other sane person would do. He just takes a book. Here you go. Here's the answer. Now will you go away, you weirdo? It's the book, Now It Can Be Told. That's the point at which we're going to bring, pick it up with tomorrow, with Tuesday, Thursday's exciting class. We're also going to talk about what's going to be on the test. But um, what's really cute, what really makes, I mean, this is where the book really takes, the, the beginning of this book was all great. But there's Kilgore Trout handing Dwayne Hoover the book, Now It Can Be Told, and Vonnegut realizes He's got to be able to read it. So he makes Kilgore, makes Dwayne Hoover into a speed reader right on the site in solipsistic whimsy, and he reads it immediately. And then he goes berserk. What happens when he goes berserk? The, kil the catabasis of Kilgore Trout continues, the sad fate of Dwayne Hoover who goes off into Enkidu land, and your test. All this and more in the next Heroine Quest. Thank you very much. Drive through.